This episode of The Minimalists is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. Enjoy the show, 100% soy, gluten, and advertisement-free. Every little thing you think that you need, every little thing you think that you need, every little thing that's just feeding your greed, oh I bet that you'd be fine without it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of the Minimalists Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. Actually, I say special, but it's, it's actually less special than most of our episodes. And here's why. I am solo today. I'm sorry about that. I'm actually supposed to be with my partner in crime, Ryan Nicodemus. We're both supposed to be in St. Petersburg, Florida right now, which is where I'd love to be in the sun recording this podcast for all of you. But instead, I, uh, my flight got canceled. And so I'm spending the holidays in Missoula, Montana and making the best of of the snow and the cold temperatures. So I am solo today, and I figured, you know, if I'm going to be solo and and record a podcast anyway, maybe we could record a podcast episode about something that only I would have some insight on. So uh, I was digging through the crates. We We have many, many crates of voicemails. Sean, I don't know why you keep all of our voicemail in crates, minimalist. Um... No, we, uh, we, we have a lot of voicemails, and we had a few voicemails about parenting. So uh, a while back, Ryan and I recorded an episode about children. I think it was podcast episode number three. And so this will, will be, this will augment that episode. You're welcome to go back and listen to that. And for all of our new listeners, uh, welcome aboard. We've had quite a few of you join us over the last week or so. And so even if parenting isn't a, a topic that is appealing to you, now is the perfect time to go back and listen to a lot of our archives. We have almost 50 episodes of this podcast, so well over 50 hours of audio content for you to uh, watch and, 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 and uh, listen to for free. You can go back and, and check out any of the topics that are most appealing to you. Uh, Whether it's technology, we have an entire episode on on technology or finances or debt or relationships and pretty much everything in between. Uh, A bunch of different episodes out there for you to go back, download, listen to the ones that sound the most appealing to you. But today, we're we're going to be talking about parenting. Now, I was actually going to record this episode yesterday, and Sean had everything all set up to, to record this episode, but I was wildly unprepared. And I realize that's actually probably a bit of a metaphor for <laughs> me and, and parenting, right? So for those of you who are, are new to the show or are new to the minimalists, uh, you'll know that I, I sort of became a parent by proxy, um, what, almost two years ago now, I, I guess, a year and a half or so uh, ago. Uh, my partner, Rebecca, she has a three-year-old daughter named Ella, and in fact, Bex and I met because Ella was flirting with me at the grocery store. So uh, I was eating something over at the good food store in Missoula, Montana. And this cute little girl, this cute little one-year-old girl, just kept waving and flirting with me. And her mother was clearly embarrassed by the, be- by the behavior of, of this one-year-old. And um, she just kept waving, and eventually, I, I, when I was done eating, I, I walked over and, and s- introduced myself, said hello, and she said, hey, yeah, I, I know who you are, and um, yeah, it was funny, because she had actually hired us to speak at the, the university, where she was working, at the University of Montana, and um, so we had a good conversation, and, and, and just started talking, and um, I'll be honest with you, I never anticipated, never planned on having kids. In fact, when people ask, like, do you plan on having kids someday? My answer was just always no. Like, I, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in the cards for me in, until it was. And, and so uh, since Bex and I have been in a relationship, I have become a, a parent and a father figure to, to Ella. And so uh, I have a friend, his name's Rob Bell, and, and he talks about... 
uh, he has three kids. He lives out in California and uh, a very prolific speaker. But uh, he, he talks about with his kids, all his kids are still at home. So he, people often ask him for parenting advice. He has a podcast and he's a former pastor. And he, um, although we don't have the same sort of spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs, uh, what, what, I, what I've learned from him is that we have similar values. And so one of the things he talks about when people ask him about parenting advice or ask him about his kids, he says, well, my kids are still at home. He has a uh, two teenagers and, and and a little girl who is, I believe, eight years old now, and he said, I, "So, I, because my kids are still at home, I don't have any parenting advice for you, but I have some observations." And then, you know, essentially, he gives parenting advice by proxy because he he has a bunch of really profound observations about parenting, and so uh, me, I, I have personally learned a lot over the last couple of years about kids and about parenting, about being a, a role model or a, a father figure. And I can tell you, it's one of the most difficult things to do and trying to adjust to that. But also, so, so any of the, the sort of observations that I have today are not going to be my own observations most of the time. So I have good friends uh, like podcast Sean here, who has, who has uh, three kids and uh, two teenagers and uh, a son in his 20s. And, and so I've gotten a, a ton of advice from him and a bunch of my other friends who have kids as well. And then, of course, I've read uh, some different stuff and, and I've, I've listened some, to some different podcasts and implemented different things over, over the last couple of years from, based on the lessons that I've learned. But just a caveat, I am still learning and I am uh, grossly unequipped to give you any good advice on, on parenting, but I will give you my observations about this process. And I know we, we, have, we have some questions that I'm, I'm going to answer for you today via voicemail and also via social media. So I think it's probably best to just dig on in right now. Let's, let's hop into our voicemail questions from our listeners. Our first voicemail is from Rachel in Sacramento. I have a daughter. She's 10 months old. Um, and so I don't know if I'm just making excuses for myself or if it really is that hard for everyone, but I, at what point, um, like diapers, cloth diapers, I know one of you has a child. I'm not sure if the other one does. Um, I, I want to reduce the footprint I leave, but I also want to make things easier and minimalistic for myself. And for me, the whole process of cloth diapering seems overwhelming and difficult. Um, are there other ways that I can kind of start to live that minimalist lifestyle with having a child? How do I pick and choose? Because I can't obviously be, you know, packing up all of my things like you guys did and then unpack it little by little. That's just impossible being a single mom. So I just want to know what are some tips that I can do with children um, to start getting us to living that minimalist lifestyle. Thanks for your question, Rachel. You know, you used a word there that I absolutely hate. And so let, let's start there and then we'll, we'll get on to the good news, right? Uh, the, the word you used is impossible. I can't do this. And I think it's really important to recognize the language that we use is either empowering or disempowering. And that's especially true, I've noticed, uh, when, when we have kids, right? Because the language we use around our kids is either going to empower them or it's going to remove the, the, the power from them. It's going to discourage them. And the same is obviously true for adults as well, right? If, if as an adult you are you're using the language that, that something is impossible, you've instantly you cut off the, the, the ability to grow, at least in that area. And so when you say uh, you can't you know, pack up everything like Ryan did, and so actually I you know, when we talk about uh, embracing minimalism, I, I didn't do the same thing as Ryan. We both had radically different approaches. In fact, I think my approach would probably be more more reasonable for you. But just because something's reasonable doesn't mean it's the best approach. Often being unreasonable is going to be the best approach because it's going to allow you to make the most radical change in your life. But let's talk about the two different perspectives that, that Ryan and I have. So you mentioned Ryan's packing party. For those of you unfamiliar, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. You can find the details at theminimalists.com slash packing. You can also take a look at his uh, TEDx talk, which is called A Rich Life with Less Stuff. He talks about that packing party, but the gist of it was 
uh, he realized that he had been working really hard to buy all this stuff, and he was focused on maybe the wrong thing. And so he pretended he was moving. He boxed up literally everything he owned in his 2,000-square-foot condo, and over the course of three weeks, unpacked only the items that he needed. And at the end of that experiment, realized that all the things that were supposed to make him happy, they weren't doing their job. And so he had 80% of his stuff, 80% of his stuff still in boxes. And he decided to donate or sell all of that stuff so that he could get, get it out of his way and then figure out what was actually important in his life, right? And so what, what he did was found a process that worked for him to let go. Now, he's a very sort of type A guy and, and wants to get fast results, as many Americans do. And while I certainly wanted fast results when I first started embracing minimalism, I realized that I had too much of a emotional tie, a sentimental tie to many of the objects I owned, and I didn't even know where to get started because the average American household has 300,000 items in it. I realized that even if I got rid of 30,000 items, it would only be reducing my stuff by, by 10%. But I knew I needed to start somewhere. I, needed, I knew I needed to get some momentum. So it took me about eight months to radically simplify my life. And, and that meant starting somewhere. Now, for me, I, I started with getting rid of one item a day for 30 days just to build up the practice of letting go. Eventually, we turned that into something called the 30-day minimalism game. Uh, you can get uh, accountable with an accountability partner. And so that's the first practical tip that I'm going to give you, Rachel, is, is if a packing party is too extreme for you, by the way, anytime I think something is too extreme for me, I, I become interested in that. Because what does that mean when we say, so, so I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a second, but, but when, when we say something is too extreme for us, that, that, that tells me it's uncomfortable for me. And I try to lean into discomfort now. Now, why do I do that? Because I've realized over the years, whenever I put myself in a place of discomfort, not a place of pain, true pain, or true suffering, but, but a place in which I am less comfortable than my day-to-day -day life, those are actually the places from which I grow the most. And certainly, having a 10-month-old daughter, they're, they're always uncomfortable, right? Kids are always in, in a position of, of discomfort, except they don't see it as discomfort. They see it as opportunity. And, and, and they, they, they approach the world with their eyes open, and they're constantly listening. They're constantly asking questions, especially when they're young. I mean, I can't tell you how many times Ella, every single day, asks me, why, 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 why? And, and then when I give an answer, it, it tends to, to be, it starts with the word because. And of course, she starts asking, why because? Because she, realize, she realizes that, that there's a pattern in my answers. And so, so when we are exploring the world from a place of discomfort, that is usually the place that we're going to learn the most. So whenever I say, think something is impossible or it's difficult or it is uncomfortable, I know that I should probably lean into that a bit. So I know, Rachel, you say a packing party is not the right thing for me. But by saying that, that tells me that it might actually be the right thing for you. Now, if, uh, if it's just way too radical for you and, and that's not the place for you to start, what about a packing party in one room Do you or a closet or a bathroom? Could you start there? And could you figure out what – because what's the purpose of a packing party? It's, it's trying to determine – what things am I actually using? What things add value to my life? And you can ask that question. For me, it started with that one thing a day for 30 days, but I had to ask the same question over and over and over. Does this thing add value to my life? And by asking that question repeatedly, uh, asking that question over the course of about eight months, I, I realized that it became less of an intellectual exercise asking, you know, does this widget that I own add value to my life? Does this, this toothbrush, this t-shirt, does this couch, does this painting on the wall, does this add value to my life? Instead of asking that on an intellectual level, by asking that question so many times, it became this visceral, emotional response. So I could then look at things and just know whether or not it was adding value to my life. And what I mean by that is, does it serve a purpose in my life? Is it a tool of some sort that augments my experience of life? Or does it bring me joy in some way? And that could be music or artwork or, or something else that, that brings me joy. And 
the cool thing is minimalism is going to look different for each of us. It's certainly going to look different for you, Rachel, uh, being in, in college and also having a 10-month-old uh, than someone who's maybe my age, 35. And I can tell you that seven years ago when I was 28 years old, my the things that added value to my life then don't necessarily add value now. So I'm constantly asking that question, does this add value to my life? Well, if you're not going to start with a packing party, although I would encourage you to maybe try to lean into that a little bit, then maybe another, another practical tip for you is the 30-day minimalism game. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. But uh, the, the minimalism game is a great way for you to inject some friendly competition in, into the mix. And, and so you want to partner up with a friend or a family member or a coworker. And at the beginning of, of, uh, of a new month, you decide to start letting go of some stuff together. And here's how it works. You, you bet whatever you want. You can bet a dollar or a meal or bragging rights or, 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 or whatever you, you decide is a a winnable and worthwhile prize at, at the end of this little experiment. And we found a way to make this this decluttering a bit more fun, right? Because to me, decluttering is one of the most boring things that you can do. And so uh, over the course of the month, you start out really simple, right? You Really easy, actually. Uh, on the first day of the month, you each get rid of one item. Second day of the month, two items. Third day of the month, three items. It gives you that momentum you need to start letting go and, and also start being a, a, a role model in that sense for, for your child as well. And, and not just saying, here's what we're doing, but showing, here's how I'm letting go and, and letting go of, of attachment to these things. But as the month progresses with the 30-day minimalism game, it becomes more difficult. Day 10, you're getting rid of 10 items. Day 12, 12 items. Day 17, 17 items. And so it progressively gets more difficult. Now, whoever goes the longest throughout the month wins. If you both make it to the end of the month, then you've, you've both won because you've gotten rid of 500 items. And I think that's a pretty good start. And, and the cool thing about it is, for me, when I let go of one item over the course of 30 days, uh, one item a day over, over 30 days, I ended up letting go of way more than 30 items. Because once you get that momentum, embracing minimalism gets easier by the day. And, and, and it becomes a, a sort of good addiction. Now, realizing, though, that getting rid of the stuff is not the point. I think the stuff is sort of the initial bite at the apple that changes everything for you. By clearing the clutter from life's path, then you start to be able to reprioritize and focus on what's important. We also have have some rules out there that will help you. Uh, a couple rules I'll, I'll recommend for you. The 90-90 rule. Have I used this item in the last 90 days? And am I going to use it in, in the next 90 days? Now, I was sitting down with, with my partner, Bex, last night. We were going over these questions together. And uh, one thing, as an adult, you know, many of the things that I haven't used in the last 90 days, uh, I, I, can, I can say that quantifiably, but then I can also say, yeah, maybe I'll use this in the next 90 days. And so I can give myself permission to hold on to it. But if not, if I don't use it within those next 90 days, then, then I want to let go of it. But as a kid, the kids grow out of stuff within 90 days sometimes. And so that 90-90 rule can even be attenuated sometimes for, for kids. Is you're going to know that a six-month-old onesie that they were, they were wearing you know, four months ago or whatever, they're, they're not going to wear that any time in the future. And so you can donate that stuff that they're no longer getting value from and it's just sitting in a closet somewhere and allow someone else to get value from, from those hand-me-down clothes. And, and uh, so the 90-90 rule has been beneficial for me. Also, the just-in-case rule, or what we call the 20-20 rule, anything you're holding on to just in case, you can typically replace for less than $20 in less than 20 minutes. And, and I think those are two good places to start, two, two good boundaries for you to, to set up and when you're looking at getting started, uh, Rachel, I also think it's important to understand the, the benefits of minimalism. So ask yourself a question. How might my life be better with less? And, and in your situation, what, is, what does that look like? Well, you, you mentioned a few things. I might may be able to produce less waste, right? Because one of the, the benefits of consuming less stuff is you're 
just by definition going to produce less waste. And I think that's great. But also keep in mind, it's not about producing zero waste. The minimalism isn't necessarily a zero waste lifestyle. It's not binary. It's not all or nothing. You're not going to produce 10,000 pounds of, of waste a year or zero waste a year. No, it's about reducing your footprint, as you said. And, and so I realize that you're cognizant of, of the amount of waste that diapers provide. And if you can do cloth diapers and, and you feel that uh, that is time well spent, because Cloth diapers are, are going to be expensive for you, but not just monetarily. Um, but there, there's an initial investment for sure, but it takes up a, a considerable amount of your time. And, and by the way, I know Bex did this with, with Ella, used cloth diapers uh, throughout a, a large portion of, of her first year on this earth, but used a, a service because, you know, didn't want to deal with, with cleaning out the, the cloth diapers herself. And so... She, she used a service to, to clean up the, those diapers, and that's an additional cost. Or if you're going to clean it yourself, that's an additional cost of, of resources, your time, and most important, your attention. How can you better spend those resources as well, especially if you're in school and you're trying to, to earn a degree? Then, then maybe that's not the best use of your time and attention. And maybe the best thing for you to do is reduce your footprint in other areas. And so by consuming less overall, you are going to, just by definition, radically reduce the amount of waste that you produce. So, so keep that in mind uh, and, and realize that that you know, the amount of hassle that, that goes along with the cloth diapers, it may or may not be worth it for you. If it is worth it, I mean, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to ask those questions. And, and if, it's, if it's not worth it, though, then you want to look at reducing waste in, in other areas so that you can prioritize your life. Because right now, I, I understand that your life is probably very busy. Uh, you, you're in a situation in your life that there's a lot going on. But uh, as Derek Sivers says, busy is a sign that your life is out of control. And, and so the busier that we get, it, it just literally, and I don't mean that as, I don't mean that pejoratively, but if we're so busy, it means we're probably in less control than we want to be. And so in order to take back control, we want to move from a, a, a lifestyle of busy to a prioritized life of, of more focus. And I wrote a lot about the, the transition of my life uh, from this very busy corporate executive. I was working 70 or 80 hours a week, and I let everyone else dictate my time. And I was busy, busy, busy all the time, but I also wasn't very focused. And in fact, I forsook the things most important to me because my priorities were out of whack. I gave lip service to many of the priorities I, I thought that many of the things I said were priorities. My health's a priority. My relationships are a priority. My uh, writing is a priority. But truthfully, our priorities are how we spend our day. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. And how we decide to use those, th th those hours are really what our priorities are. So how you, however you spend your time, those are your true priorities. And so I wrote a lot about that journey in a book called Everything That Remains. It's my favorite thing that that I have ever written. In fact, if you've uh, seen our documentary, which is called Minimalism, there's a scene where I'm out in the, the salt flats in Utah reading an excerpt from, uh, from, from that book. But Rachel, I would love to send you a, a copy of that book, either the uh, print version or the ebook version, or, or we also have a audiobook version that's, that's coming out really soon. So uh, I'm sure we can get an audible download code to send to her, Sean, if you wouldn't mind sending her one of those. Just reach out to, to Rachel and send her a copy of that. I think you'll find I think you'll find some value in that, Rachel. And uh, hopefully some of those tips will help you along the way as well. Our next voicemail is from Ray in upstate New York. From a family perspective, I did look on your website when it comes to family um, suggestions and advice um, for downsizing. Um, minimizing and I I saw some information but I wanted to see um, if you could provide a little bit more assistance in the area of um, how to initiate it um, how to uh, monitor it and then to really see be able to look back and see what the results were Ray you're certainly an analytical guy like me yeah if I were to, to re reframe your question a little bit 
so, so from a, I think it's a three part question, really. Number one is from a family perspective, how do you start minimizing as a family? That that's the first part of your question. And number two, how do I monitor the monitor the ongoing process? And then number three, how do I measure our progress, or or, or how do I uh, how do I define success would be a, maybe another way that we could talk about that. So first off, from a family perspective, how, how do I start minimizing? How do we start minimizing as a, a family? Well, the first thing that I recommend is, is finding a common language so that you can, you can talk about minimalism in a way that doesn't seem radical. Now, Ray, I don't know how old your kids are, but I think for pretty much any age, it, you can start to explain something to someone as long as you have a similar language to explain that thing. I find that quite often the, the term minimalism is the wrong word to use up front because it's off-putting to, to some people. So uh, we may use some different isms. You can say intentionalism or just living intentionally or being more deliberate or uh, be living more simply. And, and these, these terms, while they can be a bit more nebulous, they they can also, uh, I, I think, start to point people in the right direction. So if you're using a shared language, that's important. So there are a couple ways to get uh, some of this this shared language. First off, uh, right, let me send you, I know you mentioned you tried to go to our, our screening in uh, New York City earlier this year. And we didn't have, or I guess it was, it was sold out when, when Ryan and I did a tour stop there with our, our documentary. But I'd love to send you a copy of the documentary. It's on Netflix now, so if you have Netflix, you, you can check it out there. But it's also everywhere else. And uh, it's on Vimeo. And the reason I mentioned Vimeo, I'm going to send you a, a Vimeo copy. Or Sean, if he, if he wants the DVD, let's, let's send him a copy of the DVD. If you're still watching movies the old school way, we got you covered, Ray. But um, I'd love to send you the, the Vimeo copy because, or the Vimeo link, because there's six hours of bonus footage there. And I think you can dive, it doesn't mean you have to watch all six hours. There's it's something like 20 or 25 different videos. You can dive deep into the interviews that you really liked from the film. So the documentary itself is about 80 minutes long, but... Uh, if you find a particular interview that really stands out to you, like Joshua Becker and his wife Kim and, and their two kids, maybe you can dive a little bit deeper into into their family story. I think that'll help you out, those six hours of, of bonus interviews. I think that will help you establish some some common language around simplifying. And that was, that was really the reason we put together the documentary, by the way, is we wanted to show people a bunch of different perspectives on on minimalism, not just the, the Josh and Ryan show. We wanted to show you you that there are all these different minimalists who are living appreciably different lives, but they attribute their meaningful lives, their happiness, their contentment, and and, and um, their success in life. They attribute much of that to this minimalist lifestyle. And so I think that's going to help you get started using the same language. I think you also want to identify what the, the benefits are. So I mentioned a moment ago when I was talking to Rachel, uh, the question, how might your life be better with less? Asking that question yourself helps you identify what the benefits of minimalism are for you. Now, that might mean finances or health, but helping your kids understand the benefits are going, are going to be somewhat different for them. And there's going to be a whole list of benefits. So I would sit down with your kids, especially if they're old enough, and, and have a family meeting about how might our life be better if we simplified? Or how might our life be better with less? And at first, that's a, a jarring question. What do you mean, how can my life be better with less? The American dream is to have more, more, more. I want more stuff. I want, uh, I, I want more widgets and gadgets. And the truth is, I want more too. But I want more time. I want more experiences. I want more empowering relationships. I want more vitality, more health, more well-being. I certainly want more. I just want more of the important things. And that's why the subtitle of the documentary is a documentary about the important things. When people ask me what minimalism is, I'll, I'll sometimes say minimalism is the thing that gets us past the things so we can make room for life's most important things, which actually aren't things at all. And that means that the important things in our life are very rarely the material possessions. The material possessions can help improve our life, but quite often they can get in the way. And so identifying what the benefits are, what are the benefits going to be for your kids? Because they're different, right? The, having the decluttered closet is the end result. It is not the benefit. Uh, for me, having a decluttered closet gives me, it makes me calmer for sure. But, but that may not be the same benefit for a teenage kid or a young kid. So what are the benefits going to be for them? And then as a family, I would identify what are our, our common benefits? Because for you, Ray, it, it may be 
getting out of debt is a big benefit. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if that's a benefit for you or not, but if it is, then that may not really resonate with your kids. And it's great that you're going to be excited about that. But if they're not excited about it, then they don't have the leverage that they need to let go. And so when you're talking to your kids about minimalism, you're really wanting to talk to them about the benefits of, uh, so what does that look like for them? What does having a cleaner room mean for them? What does having fewer but better possessions mean for them? And then I think Ultimately, within the family, you can get some uh, internal competition going, whether that's with that 30-day minimalism game and having accountability partners within the household, but also uh, having people uh, stay accountable by having a donation box in the house. It's one thing that, that we have is a donation box, but I've noticed that even if you're not forcing people to put things in the, in the donation box, just knowing that it's there, that becomes contagious. I've had so many friends from my uh, former life back in the corporate world who have talked to me about, yeah, we, we finally started a donation box. You know, they thought I was crazy when I was first becoming a minimalist. And I didn't try to impose my brand of, of minimalism on them. They started seeing the benefits. And so they want it on board too. And if you can, if you can really tap into those benefits, you'll see that you won't even have to get them to ask and they'll start putting things in the donation box because they are going to be mirroring you. They're not going, it, it's going to be much harder for you to try to force them to give away half of their things or whatever. They're not going to be on board with that. But if they see the benefits and they see that you're doing it and you are personally experiencing some benefits, they're going to start mirroring you. We all know that kids mirror for sure. I mean, I see this with, with Ella all the time. And, and I, I know that if, uh, if I'm uh, trying to explain something to her, the best way for me to explain something to her is by doing the thing. By, by having her watch my behaviors. And so, yes, I'm, I'm often using my words, but all the time the kids are watching. No matter what, they are watching what you do, and they're mirroring. They're mirroring the good. They're mirroring the bad. They're going to mirror the consumerism. They're also going to mirror the decluttering. They're going to mirror the letting go. I know Ella now often tries to donate stuff. In fact, maybe a bit a bit too much and and because she has that that pattern built now she knows that we if we're not getting value from something that we that we donate it and we have a donation box and when she doesn't want anything anymore um even if she's you know, angry and having a fit she'll often say i want to donate this i'm going to get rid of it and, and you know, even to the point where there's you know carrots on her plate and she doesn't like them she wants to donate the carrots and it's a, it's a learned behavior, and she's learning after us. And the other thing that, that I think is important w- with a family, especially as the kids get older, to make sure you're on the same page. Bex and I, I are constantly having conversations to make sure we're on the same page about our relationship and about just everything that's going on in life. And as Ella gets older, it's going to be important to me to have – to have uh, monthly meetings and and discuss things like our finances and be willing to be open about here's where we are financially and and here's what's important uh, to our life. How do we define success as a family? Because you you mentioned earlier, Ray, uh, how am I going to measure the progress? Well, it really depends on how you measure success, right? And and also realize that once you get somewhere, once you get to a, a success point, there's always going to be a new success point. You know, if success is right on the horizon, the cool thing and sometimes the frustrating thing about success is once you get to that horizon, there's what? There's a new horizon somewhere down there. So you're constantly aspiring to be the best version of yourself and the best version of your family together. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. The question is, what's the most ideal version? We're striving to be that. So me personally, I'm 35 years old. I'm striving to be my 36-year-old self. And, and then as a family, what does my, my 36-year-old self look like uh, as, a, as a family unit as well? And so I'm constantly striving toward that. And, but when I get there, of course, there's going to be a new, more ideal version to strive toward. And so I take the, the lessons that I've learned, the, the failures that I've had. And by the way, I think it's okay to fail a lot, especially as a kid. We have this weird thing in our culture where we... We, we, we encourage our kids to only succeed, and it's gotten even worse over the last few years. We have particip- participation trophies. Um, you're succeeding even when you're failing, which actually I agree with, with that conceptually. I agree that you are succeeding when you're failing, but you're, you're succeeding because you're learning from those failures. 
I fail a lot, and it's the reason that that I, I feel so successful in my life is because I learn from those failures. Repeated failure is a bit crazy. If you're if you're failing the same way over and over and over again, yeah, that's that's sort of the definition of insanity. But if we're learning from those failures together, especially as a family, then I think we can we can move forward and have new successes. And counting on those 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 tiny successes each month when you meet and you say, okay, how did we fail this month? What's our budget look like this month? How did we succeed this month? And how do we celebrate those successes? And also, how do we celebrate those those failures by learning from them and carrying those lessons uh, forward? There's also an essay um, that, that that is in our book, Essential. So, Sean, maybe we'll send... Uh, We'll send Ray a copy of Essential as well. There's an essay about outcomes. It's called What is My Outcome? And it's not, that's another question I'm constantly asking. And I think it's really important for you in terms of measuring. We, we hear this term. I especially used to hear it a lot in the corporate world. You, you can't manage what you don't measure. And while that's that's somewhat true, I... I I think we're offering, often measuring the wrong things, right? We're, we're, we're measuring things that are measurable. And the problem with that is it, it doesn't account for many of the things that are, are far more difficult to describe. The, the, the true successes in life often can't be measured. And so a question I'm asking all the time is, what is my ideal outcome, right? And, and, and to get to that outcome, what do I need to do? You know, often people say, they, they talk about the goals they have, but they don't understand why they have those goals. So what is my outcome? But then why is that my outcome? It's so much more important to understand that why piece, right? That's the benefit of the outcome. It's the, what's the purpose behind this outcome that we're working toward together? That gives you the leverage you need to keep going. Quite often, people set goals for a family, and A, they haven't talked to their family about the goal, but B, they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. If you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, A, you're going to feel frustrated, but B, you're probably not going to have the momentum you need to keep going when times get tough. So ask yourself why, and then it's also important as well to ask yourself, is this working after you've been taking action? So so once you've taken action toward, toward that outcome, are those actions working or are you just spinning your wheels? And so as you're working together as a family, these are some important questions to ask. And in fact, I would encourage you to constantly ask your kids questions and also encourage your kids to ask questions as well. I think it's really important. And it's one of the things in our culture that uh, we, we quite often... I know that young kids, they ask a ton of questions. They're so exploratory, and we get frustrated by it. I know me, me personally, I get frustrated. You're asking the same question over and over. But I also know there will be a point when Ella's 14 years old, and I can't get her to ask me a single question. And, and that will be, that, that'll be difficult for a completely different reason. I'll be wanting her to ask questions. And so I think it's important to encourage questions to be asked because the better questions that we ask and improving the type of questions we ask, the better answers we're going to get and the more we're going to grow together. And so encouraging questions in the family, uh, constantly questioning even you is important because it's going to, it, by them asking questions, it also means that you get to shape their worldview. Because you're the one who's going to be answering the most questions in their life. And so asking those questions allows you to not just impose your wor- worldview on them, but share your worldview, open them up to your worldview, your beliefs, your desires, your values, and be able to communicate c- communicate those effectively. And also it's going to help you grow as well. I know when Ella asks me questions I don't have an answer to, I will often say I don't know because I, I don't want to be dishonest with her. But then I try to figure out what the answer is to that question. And it helps me grow in the process, and it's certainly helping her grow as well. Our next question is from J.D. in North Carolina. I'm new to uh, the whole minimalist thing, and I I used to be a a collector of of several things in regards to things of vanity. Um, When something new came out, I had to have it type situation. Um, In becoming a minimalist or minimizing things, how, how do you govern that as a parent. I always say, tell people I'm better off because of what I didn't have coming up. So I try to give my kids a, a desire to actually want for something. I think that creates some sort of work ethic. Um, I'm self-employed and I'm a barber, so I don't have, so my time sometimes is limited. A lot of times my kids spend in the barbershop with me. And basically what I'm just looking for is a focal point and how I could 
transition from all of the debt I'm in and still be a parent with kids. JD, I'm glad you are new to minimalism. Welcome aboard to, to the idea, at least. And uh, you, you said a, a word there, uh, the word vanity. You, you are a former, and, and the word collector, too. The, you're a former collector of vanity items. And that is a very honest statement. Bravo for, for bringing that to the forefront. So if you look up collector in a thesaurus, you will often find the word hoarder or the synonym for the verb collect is hoard. And so collecting is well-planned hoarding in many cases. And when you talk about vanity items, what is vanity? Vanity is a, is a veneer. I'm trying to, in, I'm trying to impose a, I'm trying to project rather a, a facade or an image of myself onto the world, you know? So I don't know if it's, you're collecting Air Jordans or, or jewelry, or uh, you know, whatever, baseball cards. Even I mean, it it, it kind of depends on what what you're trying to do. Now, do I think all collecting is inherently evil? No, I think it's problematic most of the time in our culture. But if you get true joy from you know, collecting a bunch of S- Santa figurines at Christmas time and displaying them throughout the house, great, by all means, do that. But the question is, are they actually adding value to your life? Do they really bring you joy? And, and if not, then maybe your collection is actually getting in the way for you because you have to maintain the, the collection, you have to you know, water the collection, you have to feed the collection, you have to clean the collection, you have to dust the collection, you have to put oil in the collection, whatever, whatever the thing may be, yeah, they're certainly taking care of it. The actual cost of a thing goes way beyond the price tag. Uh, especially if you're uh, storing the thing and 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 it's taking up space, the, the these are all additional costs that that are embedded in the thing that are way beyond way beyond the price tag. And so, uh, you you mentioned you grew up relatively poor and you you felt that uh, you were better off for what you didn't have. And you know what? That really resonates with me. So. Uh, I, I grew up really poor uh, back in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I was on government assistance and WIC and, and food stamps. and uh, It was a, a dysfunctional household before that term dysfunctional was in vogue. And, and so growing up, I thought we were so discontented because we didn't have a lot of money. And so when I leapt into the corporate world in my uh, late teens and then climbed the corporate ladder throughout my 20s, I figured I could become happy and, and, and content by making more money. The problem was, it wasn't the money, it wasn't just the money, I should say, that made us unhappy. It was a series of repeated bad decisions uh, throughout my childhood that made us discontent. The problem is, as I climbed the corporate ladder and made good money, I, that just uh, enhanced the amount of bad decisions I was able to make with with good money. Uh, and so, of course, I got into debt. I made really good money, but spent outrageous amounts of money and, and got to a point where I had massive amounts of debt, six figures worth of debt, which you mentioned being in, in debt, JD. And, and because of that debt, I felt anchored. I felt stressed out. I felt overwhelmed. And minimalism was a tool that I used to regain control of my life. And eventually, over the course of about four years, uh, work really hard to pay off that debt, and now I'm I'm completely debt free, and that that feels amazing, but it feels amazing because I'm making better decisions with the resources I do have, and so whether you are young or old, rich or poor, um, black or white, uh, wherever you are in the socioeconomic uh, spectrum. Minimalism is really about using the resources we have. I was talking to Bex about this last night. She grew up in a completely different background. They, they, they weren't wealthy, but they were certainly you know, middle class or upper, upper middle class. And she didn't want for anything growing up. But I think the, the reason that she had uh, such a, a, a good childhood that shaped her was for different reasons than my childhood shaped me. And by the way, my, my childhood was very difficult growing up, and I wouldn't want to ever go back to that. But did it shape me? Absolutely shaped me. It made me a much stronger person. But I think uh, the thing that, that Becca had from her, her, her childhood was you know, she had experiences that were— 
you couldn't replace with material possessions. And so when you talk about not wanting from, or, or when you talk about your ki- your kids benefiting from from desire, yes, I, I agree with that. In fact, uh, I think that we are what we desire. And so the question is, how are we going to instill in our kids the desire for more meaningful experiences? And so when I was talking to Becca about this. She was talking about you know some of the sports. You know, she was a, a soccer player, and so some of the most memorable times growing up were the the team sports that she was on or jobs she had, which were difficult. You know, she was literally shoveling horse crap uh, on a farm in in Minnesota over the summer. But that that helped shape her character and and shape who who she is today. Those experiences, and I think what what really what we're talking about here. What what's the correlation between her childhood and my childhood? Is tension and resistance. And I think what you want to create for your children, uh, whether or not they want or desire, we're all going to have wants. We're all going to have desires. You want to create the right wants, the right desires. But you're also going to want to create enough positive tension in their lives, uh, enough positive resistance. And I talked earlier about discomfort. When you get into that area of discomfort, that is the area from which you are going to grow. And the same is obviously true for your children. And so they see you right now, by the way. They they see you working hard. You know, you're a barber, and so you're working in, in, in a, in a barber shop now, and it sounds like they're, they're hanging out there. And I think I think that's important, right? Because you're spending time with them and they're going to be mirroring your behaviors. And so it's really up to you to be your best self when you're when you're in those moments. Show them that you are an entrepreneur and and that you are, you know, while you're far from perfect, you're being your best self. Because if you settle, if you settle for, you know, less money or or less time with them or whatever you're settling for, they are going to notice. They're going to notice if you're in debt, even if you're not constantly talking about it. They're going to notice if you're stressed. Uh, they're, they're going to notice if you're performing best at, at your, your job. Uh, they're going to notice the, the things that you bring into your life and the things that you, you bring in, into their life. So if you're best self because you're working on a, a passion project or you decide to travel with the family once a year or whatever it may be, they are going to notice that, but they're also going to notice all the negative things too. So you want to strive to not be your perfect self. Perfect is the enemy of, of good or even of great. You want to be your great self, flaws and all, warts and all. You want to be there for them as well. And the other thing that, that I'll tell you, JD, is I think it's also your job to enjoy your kids. And for me, that, that, that's been the biggest transition as well, is finding ways not to just tolerate Ella, you know, who's a three-year-old and has all, a bunch of kooky behaviors, but find ways to to enjoy her as a, as a human being. And I think it is it is your job first to enjoy them. Second, it is your job to raise them. And and the reason I, I think that's so important is if you enjoy them, they're going to see that joy and they are going to mimic it. They're also going to enjoy their time with you more. And, and when you're enjoying them, you are sort of by proxy, teaching them to enjoy life. And, and I think that's an important thing for you to remember. And I know earlier I mentioned my friend Rob Bell. He has talked about um, you don't treat your kid as though they are a bucket in which you pour your anxiety. And, and so I think that's the opposite side of this joy or enjoying your kids is uh, as a parent, basically, it's your job to try to work through your own anxiety and not project that on on to your kids. And I know that that's something that I certainly struggle with. Um, it's easy for me to get anxious, especially when Ella is you know, screaming in the backseat or something uh, of the car. But if I project that anxiety onto her, what's it going to do? It's just going to increase her level of anxiety. She knows when you're anxious. And so we need to be able to deal with that w- without you know, filling up their bucket with, with more anxiety. Um, another thing that he says is uh, give them as little as possible that they'll have to unlearn later. And so think about that. If you're, if you're teaching them you know, the ways of the world that are not congruent with your best self, you're going to have to try to get them to unlearn the, those behaviors later. And so the best thing to do is try to get it right the first time. And if you don't get it right the second time, then the be- or the first time, the best thing is to get it right the second time and not, not perpetuate those, those uh, negative behaviors. 
And one last thing that uh, Rob Bell says that really resonates with me is don't sacrifice your kids thriving for your cowardice. And I, I think truer words have maybe never been spoken, but I think quite often we, we fear something uh, and we don't want to have our kids do, do something. And, and it's just because we're scared. And when our, our fear stunts our kids' growth, that is, man, that, that's so difficult because we're going to have to deal with it. And then, of course, have them unlearn that later. And so um, I know one thing that you're certainly afraid about, J.D., is debt. And believe me, I can understand why. Debt is one of the biggest anchors, and I think it keeps us f- from feeling free. And we don't feel free. We certainly feel an amount of anxiety and fear and stress. We feel overwhelmed. And so, J.D., I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Essential. It's an essay collection. It has 150 essays in it. But there's an entire chapter on finances in there that I think will really help you out. There's an essay in there called Financial Freedom, Five Difficult Steps to Get Out of Debt. And I actually put a a version of that essay on our website as well. So other folks can check that out just over at theminimalists.com slash freedom. And and I really mean that. It's five difficult steps to get out of debt because getting out of debt isn't easy, but it's so worth it because especially for your kids, you want to create a life for them to where they don't don't see that debt and you don't want them to get into that same situation. So we'll either send you a print version of that book or an ebook version, or uh, it just came out on audio book as well. So Sean, if you have any audible download codes left, if you could send uh, JD either the audio book if he wants to listen to that there or the the print or ebook versions, those are available as well. We'll get that out to you. There's also an essay in there that I that I really love. It's called 11 signs you might be broke. And um, it really goes to show that we are all we've all been broke at some point or at least broke in. And, 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 and talking about getting out of, of being broke in our own lives. And by the way, I don't mean just financially. That's, that's one small sliver of, of being broke. And uh, yeah, well, I'd love to hear what everyone else has to hear, right? Because I need, I need the parenting advice as well. So uh, if you have a comment about parenting, including minimalism tips or just parenting tips in general about how you handle your kids' Then leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839. We will air our favorite comments and tips on the next episode. And here's a tip for you. Make sure you write down your message before you call in. It will help you articulate your point, and it will increase your chance of being on the podcast. Okay, let's move on uh, real quick to our hashtag Ask the Minimalist Lightning Round. This is where we answer questions from social media. And when I say we, I mean I, because I wish Ryan was here. I know all of you, you miss Ryan. You want him on the podcast. I want him here too. They go much better when we're having good conversations together. But he will be back on the next episode. So so don't worry. But uh, we're on Twitter and Instagram at The Minimalists and Facebook.com slash The Minimalists. And during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I typically answer each question with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. And then we uh, put the text to these minimal maxims, that's what we call them, minimal maxims, in the show notes so you can copy and paste our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. So um, our first question, let me pull up my document here. Our first question is from Eric. Eric asks, how do I get my kids' crap in check? They don't want to let go of anything. And my pithy answer to this is, before we let go, we should first understand the benefits. And so I know I already talked about this a bit, so I won't elaborate too much, Eric, but you got to figure out what the benefits are for your kids. If you want them to let go, what are the benefits of letting go? Too often, we illustrate the actions, but we don't illustrate the purpose. And I think that's good, by the way, to illustrate the actions, but you want to praise their actions instead of uh, praising their features. Uh, and this is one thing that that, I, that I, I deal with all the time. You know, it's weird because we often tell our kids, oh, you're so pretty. Or, I mean, Ella gets it all the time. We're at the grocery store or something. Oh, isn't she cute? 
as if she has anything to do with uh, being cute. It's like, I'm so proud. You you would never hear me say, I'm so proud you have brown eyes, Ella. But I am going to acknowledge her actions. When she does something I really like, I will stop. I will pause and I say, I really like how you did that. That is great. And when she does something wrong, I found that I've shifted over the last year or so. I found my initial reaction was something like, why are you doing that? Or just stop. What are you doing? And that doesn't work. That, 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 that's me questioning who she is as a person and, and her, as opposed to commenting on her actual behavior, her action. If I don't like something she's doing, quite often I'll say, that's not what we do. That's not what we do in this household. And, and I, I will even say, I don't like when you do this and be very specific about it. And I, that's not what we do. And I think that's more empowering because then I can't explain, here's how we do behave. And, and that's far more important. And then when we're talking about here's how we do behave, we need to explain why. And kids always want to know why for sure, but the why is really the benefit behind those behaviors. So if your kids can't let go of anything, Eric, help them understand why it's important for them to let go. And remember, the benefits for them are different from the benefits for you. All right, next question is from Erin on Twitter. She asks, my sister needs help with minimalist travel with children. They have so many accessories. Okay, well, here's my, my short tweetable answer. and I think it was exactly 140 characters. When traveling, limit yourself to what fits in only one bag. Sometimes limitations are freeing. They force you to select only the essentials. I think that's nice. I, I do that with creativity sometimes. So, so if I'm writing, I will often uh, limit myself to a, a, a time frame or amount of words, and, and uh, I call it creative limitations. Although we were supposed to leave for Florida a few days ago and before that flight got canceled, and we, we were headed down there, and, and uh, Bex had her one carry-on piece of luggage packed, and so like a little tiny suitcase that fits into the overhead bin on an airplane, and uh, she had one side completely full of, of her clothes and, and stuff she needs for, for travel. In fact, I think you, she's here right now. Did you write a blog post about, your, about travel, right? Yeah, a while ago. Yeah, so, so uh, you can, on her, on her blog, uh, minimalwellness.com slash travel, she, she writes about you know, traveling lightly. Uh, and so she had half of the suitcase empty, and Ella walks past the suitcase and says, is this my half of the suitcase? And because she knows that her mom packs everything for both of them in one carry-on suitcase. Now, does that mean that we can carry the, everything in the house? No, that's not the point of traveling, though. You want to bring only the essentials, and sometimes these limitations will force you to bring only the essentials. Another thing I'll do uh, when we're traveling with Ella, she travels with her little backpack that she has with her, and. Uh, quite often, she'll want to fill it up before we leave. So she has this little tiny backpack, but I will never, ever carry that backpack for her. It is up to her to everything that she has picked up, she has to carry. And I mean that both literally and metaphorically. Anything that your kids pick up, they should also be willing to carry that. And, it, and it's quite the lesson if, it, if it's something that's too heavy for them. And so, yeah, I, I would keep that in mind. When, when you're traveling, I think sometimes these limitations, they help you enjoy the experience a lot more because you're not lugging around a bunch of stuff. If you have two people, if you have Bex and Ella who have everything in this one piece of luggage, just one suitcase that fits in an overhead bin, you have far less stuff to worry about. Does it mean you can't pack as many accessories? Yes, but you can pack the most essential ones and it's going to help you really determine what is truly essential. All right, Mimi asks... How can I get my kids to understand that time is the greatest gift regardless of what commercials say? Well, I'm going to go back one more time to Rob Bell. I love this quote from him. He says, you are always teaching your kids and sometimes you use words. You are always teaching your kids and sometimes you use words. So keep that in mind. Quite often the consumeristic behaviors that kids pick up they pick up directly from their parents. And, and so the way to break that cycle is for us to break the cycle first and for us not to react to those commercials and for us to bring fewer advertisements into our lives. 
It's the reason we don't do advertisements on this podcast. It costs us a lot of money. We have many people who want to advertise on this podcast, but we refuse every time. And the reason being is it doesn't align with my values. It doesn't align with the best version of myself. It doesn't align with the best version of Ryan. And so we refuse to do it. Instead, we, we find other ways to, to earn an income. And, and those ways always have to align with the best version of me. I'm not allergic to making money, but I am allergic to not behaving in a way that is congruent with the person I want to be. And so keep that in mind. Uh, align, find ways to align your short-term actions with your long-term values. And, and of course, your kids will mirror that. They will follow. All right, finally, Michael asks, how can I help my kids manage the fact that social status at school is often tied to material possessions? All right, my short answer on this one is, my tweetable answer is, you don't have to try to be better than anyone to be a better human being. Now, instilling that in your kids is obviously going to be a bit more difficult. So, so let's go back to outcomes for a minute. You want to ask your kids, what, what outcome are they trying to achieve here by, by material possessions? By the way, let, let's, put, let's put this out here right away. Material possessions aren't inherently bad. I have clothes on right now. I, I own material possessions. We all need some stuff. I am not against consumption. I'm against compulsory consumption. I'm against impulsive consumption. I'm against compulsive consumption. But I'm not against com- consumption. In fact, the weird paradox of minimalism is as a minimalist, I get far more value from the things I own today than if they were watered down by 300,000 items that, that I used to own because I own so much stuff, I didn't know it was actually adding value to my life. But now I know that everything I own serves a purpose in my life or it brings me joy. I truly get value from the things I own. And so asking your kids, how does this add value to your life? And then what is your outcome? If your outcome is is social status, then then why do they want that? What's the why behind that? Well, the why is because I want to be liked, okay? I mean, that's generally the why behind social status or significance. Significance is a big why. It's a big why for me, for sure. I certainly want to feel significant, especially uh, with the people in my, my inner circle, the people I care about most. And so how can I add value to their lives so I do feel significant? What's the positive way? that I can fulfill that significant. Or, or said another way, what other paths besides material possessions can I take to get that to that outcome? Uh, how else can I be significant in a positive way? Because we all have a need for significance, and we can either fulfill that need negatively. You know, if I threaten someone, threaten to beat someone up who is less powerful than me, then of course I'm going to get significance from that person. But it's not the good kind of significance. It's significance through fear as opposed to significance through value. If I contribute to someone's life and they're grateful for that, well, then I feel significant for all the right reasons. And so how can you help them feel significant for the right reasons? How can you help them get to that outcome besides material possessions? Those material possessions, sure, they can help augment their high school experience, but they don't have to drive their high school experience. And it's the same thing that I talked about a second ago with, with advertisements or with money. I'm okay with making money. It's just no longer the primary driver for doing what I do. It, it, it's, it's fine to earn an income. It's fine to have social status. Uh, the question is, is it driving your behavior? And if so, then maybe we can change that. Maybe we can find a different outcome. And then I also saw a bunch of questions on Instagram. Uh, people are asking about nighttime sleep routines with, with kids. I try to have as few things in the routine as possible. Uh, that makes the, the routine relatively easy. We don't have a specific time that Ella goes to bed. It tends to be around 7 or 8 or sometimes 9 o'clock, uh, somewhere between there. And, and it's not about having a, a specific time necessarily. In fact, it tends to be earlier in the winter. In, in Missoula, Montana, it gets dark around 4.30 in the winter, so it tends to be earlier. You know, Ella's already commenting at 5 p.m. that it sure is dark outside. It's almost time for bed uh, because she has that behavior. Uh, we like to read before bed, and uh, obviously there's, a, there's bath time, and there is um, teeth brushing, and, and some pretty simple hi- uh, hygiene uh, routines, and then reading before bed. 
And I think those are the, the, the main things that we do to try to create a, a calm uh, place for her. But also, if, if we're traveling somewhere, we want to have fewer routines so that it is easier to get to bed elsewhere. And it's harder for kids when they're traveling to go to sleep generally. And so if you have just some triggers, uh, if, and sometimes that's, that's bath time, that triggers the entire evening routine, and then brushing your teeth, and then reading some stories, and then it's time to go to bed. And, and, and that is a simple nighttime routine. Also trying not to eat too, too soon before going to bed. Uh, I think that's just good for, for all of us uh, because uh, digestion tends to keep us up uh, a bit later than, than we would like quite often. All right, well, it's time to move on to our added value portion of the show. This is where we get to recommend something that has added value to our lives recently. And since we're talking about parenting today, I have two things for you. Uh, First off, uh, I've mentioned Rob Bell several times throughout this episode. He has an audio book that belongs to a book that doesn't exist. (laughs) I'll try to explain that here in a second. But it's called Launching Rockets. And it is just this great audio program. Uh, Becca and I listened to it on a long drive out to Seattle once. We were we were driving out there, and so Rob and his wife Kristen, who were just great people, uh, he wrote down these seventeen observations that he has about parenting and about about his children in particular, and and questions that he's been asked over the years on different tour stops and on book tours and things like that. And these seventeen beautiful, succinct observations, and it's about three hours long. It's just this audio. It's almost like a a half podcast, half audio book. It's just him riffing for two hours straight about these 17 observations that he has written down, and then during the last hour, he brings his wife Kristen in, and she gives her observations on his observations. I think a lot of you will find a a lot of value in that. I'll put a link to that in in the show notes. I think it's on his website, but you'll be able to find that there in our show notes at theminimalists.com slash podcasts. And also, if you're listening for another podcast, I get a lot of parenting advice, and I've learned so much from a podcast called Mom and Dad Are Fighting. And it's uh, from Slate. And they have a lot of good uh, advice, a a lot of tips, a lot of successes and failures that they talk about. And I know I've, I've recommended this one before, but it's the perfect recommendation for, for this podcast. So mom and dad are fighting. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. All right, let's move on to right here, right now. This is where we finally start talking about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists. As I mentioned, Ryan is down in, in Florida right now. We have a coffee shop down there called Bandit. You can take a photo tour of that coffee shop over at theminimalists.com slash coffeehouse. We're doing some upgrades to the coffee house uh, this month. We're we're doing some new furniture and a mural outside of the shop. It's just a really well-crafted, well-curated community space that we help create there in St. Petersburg, Florida with our good friends Joshua and Sarah Weaver. They're the proprietors of of the shop. They're They're the... the the brain trust behind the whole operation, and they reached out to us for some help in starting this about a year ago, and we're really proud to to bring that to everyone. So Ryan's down there right now. I wish I was there, but I'm not because of of canceled flight, but that's okay. Uh, During the holidays, our documentary is now out on Netflix, so if you haven't had a chance to watch Minimalism, a documentary about the important things, you can gather some friends around, Fire up Netflix and and watch uh, watch this documentary with your friends and family. Start some good discussions online. Share it with your friends and family online as well. If you don't have Netflix, don't worry. It's also available on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, and it's on Vimeo. All and that's with the six hours of bonus content on Vimeo, which you can just watch that bonus content by itself on Vimeo if you've already watched the film on Netflix. And if you watch uh, the film, uh, watch movies the old school way, if you're still going to the red boxes or the the 14 blockbuster videos that are still in business, did you know there's still 14 blockbusters that are in business? Uh, most of them are in Alaska and uh, Texas. And uh, Becca's pointing at me right now like she remembers blockbusters and, and she lived in Alaska for a while. Um, but yes, uh, Blockbuster is still around, but I, I don't think our DVD is at Blockbuster, but you can find it over at minimalismfilm.com. Uh, 
And uh, by the way, 2017, uh, we're potentially going to do a tour. Ryan and I are working on these these six simple ideas, and we want to do a different kind of tour. We want to do some intimate crowds. So our last few tours are like our tour in 2014. We had 75,000 people come out to 100 different tour stops. We want to do much more intimate crowds this time. So we're gonna we're going to rent out some small theater spaces or art galleries and bring these simple ideas and try them out in front of these small audiences. We're gonna announce that over at theminimalists.com. Uh, over, uh, but but what you should do if you want to be if you want to be the first to know because I'm sure tickets to those will, will go pretty quickly. Um, you'll just get on our email newsletter list. So go to theminimalists.com, type in your email. We'll never, ever send you spam because we think spam is disgusting. We'll never do pop-up ads. We'll never do advertisements, but we will keep you up to date of any tour stops that we're going to do. So if you put your email in over there, that is what is going on right here, right now with The Minimalists. All right, finally, here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Hi, my name is Carissa Hipshire. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. This year, instead of buying gifts for one another, uh, my family has decided to sponsor a refugee family coming into Ohio uh, and buy them everything they've needed for their home. It's been a great way to replace just kind of pointless consumerism that we've had before in the past uh, in our family. And it's uh, given a new family in this area a wonderful start to their life here in Ohio. Uh, it's been a great experience, and I think it's a new tradition that will continue for years to come. This is Caitlin calling from Baltimore, Maryland. I wanted to share a minimalism tip, which is to pick a brand. This might seem counterintuitive to minimalism and supportive of consumerism, but let me explain. So say you've recently outgrown your favorite winter coat, and you decide to donate it and you need to buy a new one, but you missed your favorite coat. It was exactly what you needed, no more and no less. So you decide to peruse the malls, department stores, online retailers, local shops, looking for your new favorite coat. You've spent hours, days, and weeks now looking for your new favorite coat and still have nothing. So here's my solution. Pick a brand, store, or retailer as your go-to for all items you need in your life. So you might have a go-to for your clothes. You might have a go-to for your kitchenwares and appliances. You might have a go-to for miscellaneous things like toiletries, household items. You can make standards for these brands. So, for example, I use Patagonia for all my outdoor clothes because they're environmentally and socially conscious. And I use Everlane for all of my casual and work clothes because they're known for fair trade and ethical practices. So maybe your standards of your brand are that they're quick and easy to access or that they're local or that they have organic products, whatever your standards are, but the idea is that you kind of pick your go-to and you set your standards and you stick to them. So just yesterday, I could have spent time going from Michael's to Hobby Lobby to Joanne Fabrics because I was looking for gift wrap and I thought, oh, maybe these different stores have different types of wrap. I should check them all out. But I just remembered, just pick a brand and I use Target whenever I have miscellaneous things like toiletries or stationery or things like that. And so I just went to Target, and I got that done within, you know, 10 minutes. So picking a brand can help you reduce your decision fatigue, and it reduces the amount of time that you're shopping and browsing and makes more time for the things that really matter. Hi, I'm Paul Bush. Uh, I live in Moscow, Idaho. Um, I'm an Idaho college student and a minimalist. Uh, this call is mostly about my mom, though. She's always struggled financially and views my desire for less with defensiveness, arguing about my choices when I return home for the holidays. Um, This year she said, what do you want for Christmas? I won't take nothing as an answer. Well, I took your guys' advice and I sent her a link to the UN's refugee nonprofit. And later that day, I received a notification that she had donated with a message that said, Merry Christmas. Um, And it was really cool. And it was really great that she could fulfill her need to give something to me through something that I wouldn't just re-gift or throw away. All right, y'all. And now for something completely different. Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn, and we are on Twitter Live. My guess is this is like Periscope, but on Twitter. 
or it may even be on Periscope. But I wanted to do just a really quick session of, of Ask the Minimalist. I just finished recording a parenting podcast, so some of you got to see parts of that live, but the Twitter stream gave out on me. And so let's, let's dive back into this just for a second. And uh, Sean, we'll be able to pin this part somewhere toward the end here. All right, everyone, we are back. Just a few more observations for you now that I've answered a bunch of questions on this podcast. I wanted to tune back in for a second. I am, I'm on uh, Twitter Live right now answering a few questions, but I know we have some from Instagram as well. So uh, my partner Bex is, is over there on the other side of the room. Maybe she can, she can throw a few questions out for me. And I'll, I'll repeat them into the microphone, and we can, we can talk about those questions. There were some good ones that you brought up a moment ago. Yeah, so I thought the first one we could do is the, the group of questions uh, that have to do with kids and gifts. Okay, kids and, and gifts. Questions. Yeah, a lot of people are asking about gifts for this, this holiday time of year. And instead of rehashing everything that I've talked about regarding gift-giving over the last uh, three or four weeks— I'm going to point you in two directions. One is Ryan and I did an entire podcast about gift giving. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes uh, to this episode. But I believe it was episode number 38, if I'm not mistaken. You can go back into our archives at theminimalists.com slash podcast. And there is uh, probably an hour and a half riff on gift giving, especially with kids and, and how we handle uh, gifts with, with, or how I handle gifts with Ella and with the people I care about most in my life as well. So check out that podcast episode if you're interested in gift giving with kids. We had one about sort of sentimental items, and maybe I I can just touch on it. I'll I'll try to summarize the question. We had a woman on Instagram. If you want to follow us on Instagram, by the way, we're at The Minimalists on Instagram. Pretty easy to to find us pretty much anywhere on the socials. But uh, she was asking in her question about how do I let go of all these sentimental items? I'm finding it really difficult. I find it so difficult to let go of old clothes that she wore because of all of these memories and, and all of the artwork that was drawn because there's so many memories. How can I let go of this? And, and I've built up this attachment, this sentimentality, this attachment via sentimentality to all of these, these material possessions. And I totally relate to that. And what I'll tell you, though, and this is a lesson I learned early on, when, right before I was, right as I was embracing minimalism, embracing minimalism, by the way, my, my mother died right before I, I, I found minimalism. And the first, my first foray into to letting go of stuff was letting go of some very difficult sentimental items. And she was down in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And I had to go deal with her stuff after she passed away. And it was an incredibly difficult time for me. But as I was letting go of the stuff, I learned a bunch of important lessons. I think the most important lesson I learned, though, is about our memories. Our memories aren't in our things. Our memories are inside us. And and I think they always will be inside us. I think it's nice that sometimes the things that we have can trigger the memories that are inside us. But the memories don't rest in those things. So if you keep the kids' clothes boxed up in an attic or in a bin in the basement or stuffed into a closet somewhere, and the same goes with the artwork or, or anything else, if you're holding on to these things because you think you're holding on to memories, just know that the memories aren't, aren't in those boxes. The memories are in you. And if you need some triggers to help you trigger those memories that are inside you, one of the things I did with my mom's stuff and things that I'll, something I'll do with some of Ella's stuff from time to time is take a picture of the stuff because those pictures can trigger those same exact memories. So if I need the thing, uh, I need to have access to the, the thing that triggered the memory, I have access to the photo. And the same goes with artwork or with photographs in general. I find it much more empowering to scan those and have those backed up in the cloud somewhere. Because think about this, you're holding on to all this artwork, right? You're, think, you're, you're holding on to, to old photographs or old paintings, old drawings, whatever you're holding on to. And, and what happens if you have a fire or a flood? Those things are gone forever, right? Now, it wouldn't be the, the end of the world if those things were gone forever. It, it, 
probably wouldn't really make a big difference. But if you want access to those things, then the most responsible thing to do is to scan those items. Now, you can take a look at the actual scanner that I, I use to scan photographs and paperwork, etc., tax documents, whatever, uh, over at theminimalists.com slash scanning. Uh, I did something called a scanning party. And, and I just did that because if you put party at the end of anything, Ryan shows up. And so he had a packing party. I had a scanning party. And, and we will constantly do things that are not very fun. I just put the end, uh, uh, I put the word party at the end of it, and he'll be there. So have your own scanning party, and you actually can make it a little bit more fun by bringing some friends over and scanning photographs, scanning the artwork, and talking, having conversations about those things, and scanning other people's stuff as well. Share your scanner. You know, Ryan and I share a scanner now. And, and so uh, by, by us sitting down and scanning different things, we get to have conversations about those photographs, and no longer are they occupying you know, a, a corner in the basement somewhere. I was able to let go of the physical artifacts because I knew I was not letting go of the memories. I saw the memory, the, the memories inside me. And I saw the triggers to those memories. I was letting go of the stuff, not the memories. Do we have one or two more questions? Mm-hmm. Uh, this person wants to know your thoughts on saving items for potential next children. They aren't sure if they want another child. Uh, and vendored items wouldn't necessarily be appropriate. Uh, but if they were, they could add tremendous value without needing to be purchased. Okay, so, so this person, so yeah, th- this person wants to know about, I'm considering holding on to the clothes and toys uh, and material possessions from, from my current child who's growing up for a potential child in the future. My, my answer to you would be, if you're certain you're going to have a second kid and it makes sense for you to hold on to some of this stuff, then that's that's fine. If you're uncertain, which this person is, I, w- I would strongly encourage you to to let go of, of the stuff because I don't like holding on to just-in-case items. Yeah, If you know me, you know I think the three most dangerous words in the English language are just-in-case, and that goes for our kids' stuff as well because letting go of those items will allow you to add value to someone else's life instead of hoarding them in your basement or somewhere in a storage locker on the edge of town for 10 years, uh, you can actually pass those on to someone else who can get value from them. And then by the way, you can also get hand-me-downs from someone else in the future as well. If you've established some relationships with other parents in your community, it'll actually be relatively easy for you to get some hand-me-down items in the future if, and it's a big if for you, you're not sure if you're going to have another kid. It's a big if if you're going to hold on to those things just in case. Now, if you know, if you're certain you're going to have a, uh, another kid, you want to pass it on, then you're not holding on to these things just in case, you're holding on to them just for when. And even in that scenario, I would encourage you to radically downsize. I would encourage you to to let go of many of the the items that... Um, that, that, that you're holding on to that you think you need someday in some hypothetical future as opposed to what you're actually going to need to hold on to. All right, let's do one more in this, this special live lightning round. You got one more for us, Bex? Mm-hmm. Specifically for households that have to split time with another parent, are there certain boundaries you feel it's okay to ask the other parent to respect, i.e. buying things for your kid, belief in Santa, the tooth fairy, et cetera? Or how do you explain to your child why you don't give them things the other parent does so that it doesn't seem unfair? Okay, so so if, uh, and I'm I'm certainly in this situation, I'll repeat the question here real quick. If you are are in a household that is a divided household, so to speak, you have you have uh, two parents who are, are no longer together, and then you have a new partner or, or new spouse it, and uh, with a, a, a certain different belief template uh, between, between those two households. How do you communicate to the kid that the two sets of parents have different beliefs? And I, I, one that stands out to me right away is Santa Claus. Like I, I, I clearly don't believe in Santa Claus, and I think that it's a lie to tell Ella that Santa Claus exists, even though she thinks she does because she saw Santa Claus at the mall recently. And I had to explain to her that Santa Claus is a man who is dressed up at, like Santa Claus. And it's okay to, to believe in him as an imer- imaginary f- figure. And I, the, the illustration that I used to explain Santa Claus to her was 
uh, she loves watching this cartoon, this British cartoon called Peppa Pig, and clearly she doesn't believe those are real people. She knows that those are made-up characters, and that if I were to put a Peppa Pig costume on, I wouldn't become Peppa Pig. I would just be a, a imaginary character. I'd be dressed up as an imaginary character, and Santa Claus is, it is the same thing, so I'm not going to tell her uh, I'm not going to lie to her, and, but at the same time, I don't want her to be. I don't want her to be the kid who who goes around, you know, telling kids that Santa isn't real. And it's not her position to rain on everyone else's parade, either. And so, the, her father and I may have different beliefs about about many different things. And I think I think the key here is to just be open and, and honest with her, and and to communicate. Uh, with her, even even though she's three years old, to find ways to communicate with with Ella effectively, that, that um, and explain to her why I, I do what I do, and and it's the other parent's job to explain why they do what they do. And the only thing that I can do is put my best foot forward in in this scenario, and 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 try really hard to explain what my values are, what my beliefs are, but in a way that's not esoteric or erudite, in a way that she can understand. Stand. And, and the, the best way to do that is through, through my actions and, and through being willing to, to, to talk to her when she has questions about something like Santa Claus or, or about rituals or traditions that we have. Because let's face it, we all have tr- different tradi- uh, traditions, even if they are similar traditions. And many of us like celebrate Christmas, but some of us celebrate, uh, like me, I celebrate in a secular sense, not in a religious context. Many people will celebrate Chris- the same thing. They celebrate Christmas in a in a religious context, and and that's okay. We're, we're effectively celebrating the same holiday, but for completely two two completely different belief templates. And so we get to that same thing via different paths. And the best thing that I can do is 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 articulate my path to uh, to to that ritual or to that tradition, to that that holiday experience. And it's not up to me to articulate everyone else's path. I can do my best to to be open and honest about my, my thoughts about those things. But also, I want to be very careful not to denigrate other people's beliefs in, in front of her, especially people that she cares about. And, and so it's not my position to knock someone else's belief template. It's, it's my position when she asks questions to instill uh, what I believe in, in her. And, and I think we'll leave it at that. That's a good place to end this episode. Sean, I don't know where we're going to post this in, in the episode itself. I want to say hello to everyone out here on Twitter. Uh, we're trying out Twitter Live for the first time now. And so um, I'm going to sign out from the podcast. And I'm also going to sign out from this Twitter live stream. Thanks for joining me. Oh, by the way, if y'all haven't seen it yet, our documentary, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things, is now on Netflix. I would be very grateful if you left it a five-star review if you found value in that film. If you don't have Netflix, you can find it anywhere else. All the links are over at minimalismfilm.com. Hope you find value in that. We'll see you next time. Until then, love people, use things. The opposite never, ever works. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have you gotta reach for and you gotta grab oh i bet that you'll be fine without it so tear your eyes away or tear